Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Health. My name is Kavitha Mishra. I'm the Director of Clinical Programs at the Osher Center, and I'm filling in for Dr. Shelley Adler, who is uh, at a conference today. Again, it is my deep, deep pleasure to introduce Dr. Linda Shu. She's an internal medicine physician and chef. She's Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine at Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine uh, and has been a faculty member at UCSF and Stanford University as well. She's the Director of Culinary Medicine and Lifestyle Medicine at Kaiser Permanente San Francisco. She founded Thrive Kitchen, a teaching kitchen for patients there. Her cooking classes have incorporated seasonal produce, fresh herbs, spices to create healthy and delicious meals. Dr. Shu also serves in her, so, sounds like, how could you have any free time, but she finds a way, serves on the boards of San Francisco Marin Food Bank, Meals on Wheels of San Francisco, and the Teaching Kitchen Collaborative. She's a graduate of Brown University, San Francisco Cooking School, UCSF, and the kitchen of Michelin-starred restaurant Murad in San Francisco, and has a certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University. Her first cookbook, Spice Box Kitchen, was a 2022 finalist in the International Association of Culinary Professional Awards. And just a reminder, after Dr. Shu's presentation, we'll have 15 minutes for discussion. So please submit any questions uh, to me by the way of the chat feature, or even better, um, uh, start your video and you can pose your questions directly to our speaker during the discussion. And before we get started, I want to, on behalf of Dr. Adler and the team, thank our Grand Rounds Planning Committee, Drs. Selena Chan, Anand Dhruva, Patty Moran, as well as Jen Shea, Yvette Coulter, and Julia Burns. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shu. And Dr. Shu, you'll unmute. There you go. Thank you. Um... I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. yes. And I need to reshare my screen. I don't know what happened there, but um, I just want to make sure everybody can see this now. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Um, all kinds of technical difficulties this morning. Welcome, everybody. I'm really excited to be here and um, present on my most passionate topic, which is culinary medicine. And I was asked to talk about how this might advance health equity in underserved populations, which I think is um, a pretty new topic for a lot of people. And so um, I'm very excited to share my thoughts on this. Um, so my objectives today are modest, but I'll be giving you a lot of details in all of these areas. So I would like you to be able to recognize the links between food and nutrition insecurity and health describe dietary patterns that prevent and reverse disease, explain how culinary medicine and using teaching kitchens to do culinary medicine can improve health outcomes. So first we'll start with some definitions. What is health equity? Two very simple words. I think you all know what each of these words mean alone, but uh, the concept itself is very rich. So this is the official CDC definition. Health equity is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. And this requires ongoing societal efforts to improve this. We need to address historical and contemporary injustices, overcome economic, social, and other obstacles to health and healthcare, and do what we can to eliminate preventable health disparities. Um, so this last point is what I hope to focus on today. And I think that when we're trying to make a big change in society, we need to use creative solutions. So that is what I think culinary medicine can be. As for defining what food and nutrition insecurity are, you're probably all familiar with this concept of food insecurity, which is pretty much the lack of enough food. Is there enough food? Um, nutrition insecurity is actually a relatively newer concept um, that's been talked about in the last year or years. Um, this is a lack of consistent access, availability, and affordability of foods and beverages that promote well-being and prevent and treat disease. So this is more than just, is there enough food? Let's not care what it is. This is, is there the right food that will promote health? 
In terms of the numbers of uh, the food insecure, um, even before the pandemic, um, it was pretty high in this country. About 20% of uh, people of color, especially, were in food insecure households. Um, and this increased a bit to even 25% percent um, during and after the pandemic. As I'm sure you are all aware, food prices have gone up and they've stayed up. Locally, um, 55,000 San Francisco households obtain food from the San Francisco Food Bank every week. And this affects disproportionately people of color and families with children. So this is where that we really see the disparities and the lack of equity. And as I mentioned earlier, food has great impacts on health equity. Uh, this is hot off the press with a just released Lancet report on health and climate change. And it's pretty grim. Basically, this problem that we're already sitting with has gotten even worse and will continue to get worse um, with global warming, the effect on crops, the effect on availability of food because of that, and also the effects directly of climate change and global warming on health and disease. So we're going to see more and more people with food insecurity and nutrition insecurity. So I think we can all imagine, yes, if we don't have enough food, that's going to affect our health. But to get more specific, all of these things listed here in blue are known and seen in the literature. We have data. These are all very specific health effects of food insecurity. Obesity, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, stroke, certain cancers, and recently COVID-related death. All of these are direct consequences of food insecurity. I've put on the right here the two-item food insecurity screener, which is a validated measure, which um, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, um, are two simple questions, which I, I know to many people sound similar, but they actually can evoke different answers. So we ask both of these questions. The first is, within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money money to buy more. And the second is within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to buy more. So these are the two questions that can be given to patients uh, to find out if they are um, experiencing food insecurity. And I like to add that when I screen, I like to start with actually a, a little script before to make people feel comfortable answering these questions um, and so that they'll answer them honestly, which is we basically, we screen everybody for these questions. Many people have found it difficult to buy the food that they would like to eat or the food that they know that is better for their health um, since food prices have gotten very expensive. So I usually start with that and I haven't had a problem with anybody wanting to answer the questions after normalizing it. So why is food in particular important for health equity? Um, because it's the most important thing. So we know that poor diet quality is a leading risk factor associated with death in the US. This is not just illness, this is death. And so we really need to focus on anything that we can do to improve nutrition insecurity. And of course, you know, we're in an age of lots of medical advances, new pharmaceuticals, new technology, but nutrition is still the base of everything that we can do to improve health and um, extend lifespan. 90% of our healthcare costs are due to chronic conditions. 50% of premature deaths are due to lifestyle factors, including nutrition. A full one in five deaths are due to diet. This is a really huge and stark number that I would like you to think about for a second. One in five, 20% of premature deaths can be prevented if we can improve people's nutrition. And yet only 10% of Americans meet dietary guidelines. And um, in a survey, almost a third of Americans said that they don't know how to cook. This last point is something which uh, we can definitely address with culinary medicine and teaching in kitchens. So we can look at this in a negative way. You know, there's climate change, there's not enough food, a lot of people are food insecure, or we can look at it as a positive, th that diet is a modifiable risk factor and therefore we can do something to improve this. There are, there's lots of room for improvement. We know that added sugar is linked to obesity, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. 
Animal fat consumption is associated with obesity. Processed and red meats are associated with an increased risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and all-cause mortality. And this is what we like to call the, the low-hanging fruit. Ultra-processed foods are low in fiber, micronutrients, and phytochemicals. Um, and those are the things that are good for us. And on the other hand, they're high in fat, sugar, and sodium. So looking at that last bit, ultra processed foods and teaching people how to cook so that they can get away from them can make a very big impact. Uh, one very specific example of this we can look at is how diet and different types of diets can be related to incidence of obesity and type 2 diabetes. This is a very large study of uh, almost 61,000 adults studied over four years, the Adventist 2 health study, that looked at diets ranging from kind of the standard American diet, a non-vegetarian diet, all the way to a completely vegan or whole foods plant-based diet. In between, you have different shades of vegetarian from semi-vegetarian, pesco-vegetarian, and lacto-ovo-vegetarian. And it's a pretty stark linear um, association with a decre decreasing rates of uh, obesity and decre decreasing rates of type 2 diabetes as you proceed from the standard diet to a completely whole foods plant-based diet. Um, now, I mentioned many different chronic diseases that diet can affect, but prediabetes and diabetes are really big epidemics in our country. 10% of American adults have type 2 diabetes, and this is increasingly importantly in our younger citizens, children and young adults. Um, and then prediabetes, which is a precursor to type 2 diabetes, currently affects almost, uh, you know, uh, almost 40%, 38% of US adults. That's a huge number. And if we don't do something about this, um, in particular with nutrition and exercise and then many other things, we're gonna see a lot more diabetes in this country. So what are these plant predominant diets that don't necessarily have to exclude all animal products? Because I'm well aware that um, it's only a small percentage of people who are interested in becoming completely vegan or even vegetarian. Um, the good news is there are many variations on this. The Mediterranean diet for which we have a lot of data um, for being a heart healthy diet, the DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, and the Whole Foods Plant-Based Diet are all in the realm of what I would like to call plant-predominant diets. Other words that are used for this are plant-based or plant-strong. Um, they all mean that it's mainly plants. So all of these maximize the intake of whole plant-based foods and minimize the intake of processed and animal-derived foods. Um, in other words, it's eating food close to what it looked like when it was grown. And in doing so, we add the good things that are found only in plants, phytonutrients, antioxidants, and fiber. Really important. These are all things that reduce the incidence of chronic disease and mortality, and they're found only in plants. Um, and the idea is that by crowding, uh, by eating more plants, you'll crowd out the things that are not so good for our health that are found in animal-based foods. These are saturated fat, cholesterol, antibiotics, hormones, and heme iron. Um, another way to look at the benefits of plant-predominant plant diets, um, one simple step, and I always like to give one simple step because it's very hard for someone to make a wholesale change in their lifestyle, but it's actually pretty easy to say, let's just try out this one small thing. So one small thing could be cutting out your red meat consumption or cutting down to less than half a serving per day. A serving of red meat is three to four ounces or about the size of a deck of cards. So if you make it half a deck of cards, you can prevent one in 10 premature deaths. That's a huge, huge consequence of a very small um, thing that you could do. That could mean have your red meat every other day, for example. Uh, um, and in contrast to that, we know that eating plant-based proteins instead of having especially red meat is associated with lower risk, severity, and reversal of many chronic diseases. And as we're talking about climate, this also leads to a, a sustainable and smaller carbon footprint. Another large study um, in the last couple of years looked at diet and life expectancy. And this study looked at the Mediterranean diet, mainly because that's mainly what's been studied in the literature. 
Um, and this is in comparison to the standard American diet. So I want us all to keep in mind that we're always looking at any of these dietary patterns in contrast to kind of the standard or baseline. And it's that difference that can make the difference in our health. So we found, it was found that the Mediterranean diet increases life expectancy, importantly, at any age. It is never too late to make a change. So while the greatest gains were seen in young adults, um, adding up to 13 years um, to a lifespan if young adults adhere to the Mediterranean diet, even at age 80, you can add another three and a half years to your life if you make that change. So I think that's another important message. Um, on top of my first message of every bite counts, every little bit of moving towards a more plant predominant diet makes a difference. No matter what time you start this in your lifespan, it'll make a difference. And we get the largest gains from adding more legumes, whole grains and nuts and decreasing the amounts of red and processed meat. But a lot of this, diets and dietary patterns, is very theoretical. People eat food, not nutrients. You know, when you sit down to your breakfast this morning, you're not, you're probably not thinking, some of you might be, what nutrients am I going to eat now? You're thinking, what food am I going to eat? And so we may, need to make this very concrete and actionable for people. Um, so I'm going to spend the next couple slides talking about um, one intervention, which is basically what's called food as medicine. There are several ways that food as medicine is conceptualized. Um, and in last year, we had this huge conference with the White House, the first one since 1969 to talk about food. And that's a really long time to not talk about food. Um, and that was the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition and Health. Um, some of the proposals that came out as action items out of this White House conference were uh, produce prescriptions, medically tailored meals, and increasing nutrition education. And they actually did mention even the word teaching kitchen, which is huge. Um, so I'd like to talk about what each of these refers to. The first is produce prescriptions. And that sounds like what it sounds like, which is basically prescribing produce to patients. But what that really means is both prescribing and providing uh, produce to patients who might otherwise not be buying it or may not have access to produce. The second is medically tailored meals, and that's getting a lot of press because that's something which can be um, basically produced for people. These are prepared meals that are tailored for certain health conditions. It's They've been studied primarily for conditions such as congestive heart failure and diabetes um, and cancer. Um, and um, so far, the studies have shown some potential benefit on reducing hospitalizations and reducing healthcare costs with medic medically tailored meals. Many studies are still going on right now. And then the third is what I'll uh, spend most of this talk on, which is on nutrition education and teaching kitchens. Um, so a couple of slides on food pharmacies. Studies have shown that um, doing food pharmacies and prescribing food to, in this case, type 2 diabetics can not only improve health outcomes um, in terms of improving um, the A1C level, which is the average blood sugar, um, at a pretty minimal cost of about a couple thousand dollars per patient per year, and with an incredible medical savings of $9,000 per patient per year. Another very large analysis of food pharmacy programs throughout the country um, showed um, really dramatic, impressive in, impacts on both um, health and on um, savings. Um, in terms of on health outcomes, we saw that food pharmacies can improve intake of produce and also improve many different health outcomes, A1C, body mass index, and blood pressure. So the data show that food pharmacies work. So my first point was that people eat food, not nutrients. The second is that people only eat food if it tastes good. I'm sure many of you have had the experience of trying to improve your, um, your diets um, and you'll try something drastic and then maybe give up after a couple of weeks if it doesn't taste good to you. So we need to make food that we want people to eat that we know is good for their health actually tastes good. Otherwise, it looks like this. I'm actually kind of a fan of what I like to call bad food photography. And this is an example of banana salad bazaar, which I would actually spell bazaar in another way. This is not this is not appealing. And while it is actually all produce, which I, I am recommending, this does not look good to people. So we need to get people to understand that healthy food is something that they want to eat, not something that is a torture. This is where culinary medicine comes in. 
It's the art of food and cooking blended with the science of medicine. It teaches people to achieve their best health through eating meals that prevent and treat disease and restore well-being. So it's food that not only is good for you, but actually makes you feel better. And this last point is the part that I like the best. It empowers patients to use food for self-care. Studies have shown many benefits of home cooking. So the point of culinary medicine is to promote home cooking or to start home cooking for people who don't already cook at all. Studies have shown that eating out is associated with obesity and poor diet. Um, and on the contrast, that home cooking is linked to increased intake of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, a lower BMI, and improved general health. And I've already shown you many examples of that. Home cooks are also more likely to achieve nutrition guidelines for fat, calcium, whole grain, and fruit and vegetable intake. And as you might remember from my first slide, only 10% of Americans currently meet dietary guidelines. So we, we have a place here that we can make a big inter impact and intervention by teaching people how to cook. Hopefully we can get people to meet the, those nutrition guidelines and improve their health. Other benefits of home cooking are better portion control, better calorie control, fewer or no additives, less added salt, sugar, and fat, better control over ingredient quality, and also saving money and the non-nutritive uh, benefits of family meals, which is you know togetherness, joy, family time, psychological well-being. So I'd like to propose culinary medicine as a clinical intervention. This is the same as a prescription. This is the same as a medical device, um, but just thinking about it in a slightly different way. So how is this a clinical intervention? It's a way of tying nutrition and cooking advice to healthcare. So as opposed to, you know, a lot of patients coming to the clinic and feeling scared about the bad news that they might get or feeling judged or, um, you know, the scary part of having to get some sort of test or procedure done, this by bringing it to the healthcare setting or coming from someone's healthcare provider brings a very positive association association to the place or the people that provide healthcare to a patient. It can be quite a low cost and accessible intervention and can be culturally adaptable and needs to be. As I mentioned, it's empowering. It's putting pa help, uh, patient's health into their hands, which can inspire adherence, including to other parts of a healthcare plan that you might be forming with the patient. And it's very practical. It's showing not just telling. It's something that is, again, very active for the patient as opposed to something that we are telling them to do. So the power of teaching kitchens is that it can be a place in a fun way to teach nutrition literacy, to teach cooking skills and increase level of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is something which has been shown in um, the behavior change literature to be one of the most powerful things. If we can improve people's self-efficacy, we can improve many, many facets of their health, um, not just the one thing that we're focused on in this case, which is teaching them how to cook. Many studies have shown that cooking classes are very effective at changing behavior. So we have found that cooking instruction, instruction promotes dietary change more effectively than nutrition education alone. So the standard practice is, um, if we even think about it, maybe we will refer someone to a health educator, to a class or to a dietitian, and um, they're given education on this. And this will improve their knowledge about how what they eat and how they eat impacts their health outcomes. Cooking instruction takes another step. Uh, we know that vegetable and fruit consumption increases with food demonstrations and tastings. I'm sure you, you have experienced this yourselves when you've had samples of fruit at farmer's market. When you bring a child to the farmer's market and they look at something they've never seen before, they, they're more willing to try it. Um, and of course, you know, we've all had samples of food in grocery stores, and that's why they give out the samples, you're more willing to buy it then. So it's this experiential part of it, uh, that's especially important with food, this is something that we need to want to eat. Um, teaching kitchens also provide a supportive peer environment. So again, this is a place where it can be fun, um, where it's not a big deal if you make a mistake, and you're cooking alongside other people who are also experiencing something new. Um, 
a, a later thought that I've been thinking, which hasn't been studied that much. I'm sure you've heard a lot about the loneliness epidemic and how much that impacts our health. Um, in fact, that's been the priority of the Surgeon General. A teaching kitchen, um, in my experience, has been a great place to build community. Teaching kitchens can also build community um, and bring to, together people of diverse backgrounds um, by also promoting the diversity of nutritious food ways and flavors. Uh, teaching kitchens can celebrate culture and connect people with plant-based traditions. So again, going back to a more plant-predominant diet um, that existed in kind of all cuisines um, before colonization and westernization, and really the commodification of food has changed diets around the world. So this is kind of bringing us back to the roots of traditional diets. This is a picture of several different food pyramids um, from Old Ways, which is a nonprofit in Boston, which originally was started to promote the Mediterranean diet, which again was um, the most studied diet uh, prior to newer studies now. Um, I'm really happy to see that they've now created other dietary pyramids, the African Heritage Diet Pyramid, the Asian Diet Pyramid, and the Latin American Diet Pyramid. Um, what you can see in all these illustrations, and my, my only comment would be nice to see real food in these pictures, um, is that they're all more similar than they are different, right? We are all more similar than we are different. The base of all these pyramids is actually not food, but other lifestyle factors that can have a very big impact on our health, physical activity, social connection, things like that. And then the food part of the base of the pyramids is all plants in all of these different pyramids, pyramids with different amounts of other foods above that. This is another slide that I really like. Um, and this comes from different uh, dietary guidelines around the world that's shared on a WHO website. And you could spend a lot of time looking at that. There are many, many of these. Um, and so you can see with these as well, um, a lot of them, people are converting to the plate model as opposed to the pyramid, because that, again, is a better concept of how we actually eat. We eat on a plate. We don't eat on a pyramid. Most of these, again, show you that they're more similar than they are different. Um, the one in the upper left-hand corner does focus on real food, and that comes from Canada. And that shows you that it's mainly plants, half of it, um, legumes, and whole grains. And so that is what Canada is promoting there. Um, in all the other countries, you, you can see illustrations that show maybe the different types of produce that they eat, but they all have kind of these similar concepts. Um, and then we have a couple of other different shapes here. Um, the second one um, is from China, and that's in the shape of a pagoda. Um, and then the one next to that is from France, and I think it's meant to evoke their tricolor flag. Um, and then a um, couple other things you see, there's physical activity highlighted in a couple of the pyramids, um, the one from China, and also in the lower left-hand corner that is from Jamaica. And um, these are countries which have a lot of Olympic medals. So um, you can see how culture actually shapes a lot of our worldview on how we think about eating. But all of these emphasize these things, right? So if you're gonna remember only three things that will improve health and diet, they are legumes, leafy greens, and whole grains. So some of you may be thinking, well, I don't have a teaching kitchen or I'm not going to teach my patients how to cook. I'd still like to um, encourage you to practice culinary medicine. And one of them is one of the ways that's very simple that we can all do as healthcare providers is just to ask your patients about what they eat. Um, and so I'm going to provide you here with some open-ended food history questions to get you going there. You can ask, what is your typical breakfast, lunch, and dinner? This is actually a really great icebreaker, right? People like talking about food and they like talking about what they do. And so that's a good way to start. Um, you can ask if they're on a special or restrictive diet, if there are any things that you, you know, they cannot have. Um, ask them what the staple foods are in their family or culture. This is also a really great icebreaker that you can learn a lot about a person. You can learn who cooks in the home. Does anybody cook? What are, you know, what are the barriers there? And what are the things that you like to eat? Um, and then you can ask about, you know, quantities of eating meat, beans and legumes, leafy greens, whole grains, 
importantly, ultra processed or packaged foods and sugar sweetened beverages. This is a good starting off point and it's a richer way to do a nutrition intake. Um, and again, a way that you can practice culinary medicine even if you do not have a teaching kitchen or intend to teach cooking. These are some tips that you can share with patients on how to create sustainable cooking habits by making food delicious. Remember, we eat food, not nutrients, and food has to taste good if we're going to stick with it. So encourage people to eat seasonally and eat to eat the rainbow. Um, those of us in California are very, very lucky. I'm originally from the East Coast where we didn't have farmer's markets year round, but here we do. We, um, there are you know endless farmer's markets around the city. And by eating seasonally, food is at its peak nutrition, it's less expensive, and it's you know a good way to kind of have a fun way introducing diverse produce into your diet. I really like the set concept of encouraging people to make plant-based versions of foods from their cultures. In my cookbook, I basically did that where I took kind of traditional recipes, the way that people eat them now and, and brought them closer to their plant-based roots. And people can do that no matter what their favorite foods are. Um, to focus on flavor, not just salt. Um, and so that means herbs and spices um, and to reduce salt, adding more acidic flavors, uh, lemon juice and vinegar can trick your palate into thinking something has more salt in it than it is. And so that can be people who are trying to cut down on added salt um, by adding other elements of flavor. Also think about texture and presentation and use healthier fats. These are all things that people can do at home, make their food visually satisfying, make it interesting um, to the palate by inc including a lot of different textures. And not forgetting flavor, you can do this by exploring herbs and spices. So spices can add flavor, but they also connect you to a lot of different cuisines. It's kind of fun to play around with spices. Um, and they also have health benefits. They were our first medicines as a class. They're anti-inflammatory and chronic disease is all tied to inflammation. Um, they can also promote a diverse microbiome. This has been shown in studies because remember uh, spices, uh, or I did not remember, I didn't tell you, spices all come from plants um, and plants all promote, uh, promote a diverse microbiome. So adding spices actually is one way to do that while adding flavor and other health benefits. So I want to take a few minutes to focus on, I think, some nice examples of culturally responsive culinary medicine. The first is from Boston Medical Center, and this comes directly from their website, and I'd like to read it to you because I think there's so much that is wonderful in this one slide. So food is a celebration of diversity. No single culture has a monopoly over healthy food. In the teaching kitchen, we strive to celebrate diversity through food by preparing meals with starches, vegetables, proteins, and fruits from the cultures of the community we serve. And how are we celebrating diversity in the teaching kitchen? One, substitutions. Substituting ingredients based upon preferences and availability. So this speaks to both um, access to food and also preferences, which might be from somebody's culture. Accessibility, budget-friendly mix of fresh, frozen, and canned foods. Well, I've just talked about how great it is that we have farmer's markets, um, and I'd like to also point out that the San Francisco Marin Food Bank provides 60% um, of what they provide is fresh produce, which is really excellent. Um, frozen can also have very high nutritional value and is much more affordable and accessible for a lot of people, and also certain canned foods can be a healthy part of a diet. I like to talk about reading nutrition labels and avoiding um, you know, of things that have a lot of added salt. Um, and then if you're buying canned beans to rinse them. So there are certain things that we can do that can improve upon what people can afford. Um, in terms of time, they focus on quick, simple recipes. People who have, you know, one busy job or maybe multiple jobs don't have time to cook a lot, things that take a long time to cook. So teaching quick recipes is a really great way to think about that. Um, ability. So making cooking work for the person, their energy level, and their body. So how someone's um, health might affect their ability to really stand. You don't have to stand where you're cooking. So there are different ways to think about that. Um, they teach classes in, in a variety of languages. And this last bit is really great. Um, inviting guest teachers from the community, um, offering classes that are taught or co-facilitated facilitated by patients and community members from different backgrounds. 
this is a really great way to focus on patient-centered care, to think about cultural humil humility, how we can learn from our patients as well. Um, and this goes a really long way towards achieving health equity. Locally, I'd like to highlight what you have here yourselves at UCSF. So doctors uh, Gina Moreno-John and Diana Fiera from the Department of General Internal Medicine have two of the concepts I've talked about, food, a food pharmacy with a cooking demonstration right here at UCSF. So there are three distribution sites for, for the food pharma pharmacy. That's at Mount Zion, Lakeshore, and the Men of Color program at Parnassus. And they have uh, cooking demos that are done at Mount Zion. So this is one of their staff members um, doing a cooking demo. And what you can see here, one, it's, a, it's not in a fancy kitchen. It's in a conference room. Right, so no special equipment. Um, there's a lot of produce here. What I also see um, in the picture, there's some spices, there's a bottle of olive oil, there's some healthy fats in the form of peanut butter, um, and it's a one pot recipe using a simple hot plate. So this shows how accessible teaching cooking can be. So something to keep in mind. So I think it's it's quite intuitive um, that teaching people, giving people access to food and teaching people how to cook can have impact on their health. But there are actually tons of studies um, that look at improved health outcomes from culinary medicine. Um, so I've mentioned most of these already, diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, body mass index, um, adherence to the Mediterranean diet and improved fruit and vegetable intake. But the last few on this slide are um, some interesting studies that look at um, kind of non-directly nutrition related things that you wouldn't think of. Um, this is improved self-esteem, self-efficacy, socialization, psychological well-being, and qual quality of life. These are all parts of health that can be a little bit more difficult to measure, but they have wide-ranging impacts on the health of individuals and also of communities, and again, in building health equity. Um, I'm choosing this study because it comes from Taiwan, where my family comes from, and I don't know if any anyone who is from Taiwan might recognize what's um, on the right there, but these are the Datong rice cookers, which are iconic in, in Taiwanese kitchens. Um, but this study looked at cooking frequency in geriatric populations and found that cooking, not actually even what they ate, but just the act of home cooking alone improved longevity and improved uh, maintaining nutrient-dense diets. Um, another program, which we do have locally, which is called Cooking Matters, um, and it's a national program, um, is a group that teaches cooking to people at risk for food and nutrition insecurity. And their studies showed that at three and six months after completing their six-week program, participants had improved confidence and ability to stretch their food, both their money spent on food and their WIC foods. And why is this? Teaching people how to cook actually reduces food waste, which is also circles back to what we can do to um, reduce climate change by basically not wasting the food that we are able to grow. Um, when you learn how to cook and when you are on a budget, you actually learn to get creative with the food that you have, you know, and instead of not knowing what to do with it. This is a really important point. Um, in another talk that I went to recently, another point was made that if people don't know how to use the food that they're getting, let's say from the food bank, they're going to throw it away. And I've you know, seen this walking around our neighborhoods where I'll see you know, after a neighborhood pantry day, I'll see unfortunately some food, some really fresh produce discarded on the side of the road. And this is where it's again, not enough to tell people to eat the right foods, tell them to eat produce, to give them the produce, right? That's your produce prescription or your delivery from the food bank. If we don't tell them how to use it, it's going to be discarded and it has no benefit for either the climate or individual health. So again, very important for in reducing health disparities if we make this educational effort here. So what is a teaching kitchen? I actually just added a few slides last minute this morning um, to show you what they can look like and, and how there can be great variety. This is the teaching kitchen of my dreams, but it's not mine. This is at Google in um, New York. And all of the Google um, 
uh, sites have teaching kitchens uh, and cooking classes for their employees. So this is a really beautiful teaching kitchen. It has lots of great AV. It has many high-tech stations. It has chefs. Doesn't have to look like that though. So this next slide shows you Thrive Kitchen, which is a teaching kitchen I started at Kaiser here in San Francisco in 2017. You can see that it's a pop-up in a conference room. It does require some equipment, um, but it's all on wheels and all convertible. And another time, if anyone's interested, I can talk to you about what I think are the best practices for setting up a pop-up teaching kitchen. Um, but you can see that the same thing that we use to prepare the meals on, these uh, restaurant style prep tables convert into one long table at the end of the evening. And this shows you the ability to build community, share foods, talk about nutrition, where everyone is really comfortable and happy eating food at the end of a lesson. Um, and then this can show you how, even if you don't have a kitchen, and this is what things hap what happens in pandemic times of having a virtual teaching kitchen. Um, and this is an example of one setup that I have used. You can see that there's a laptop. There is, if you want a second camera, um, an iPhone on, on a tripod, a ring light, and then my setup, and then what you can see from the other side. So it can be pretty messy on the instructor side, um, and then um, we, but it, you can only see what I show you on the camera. So pretty much anybody can do this. You, you, there's a little bit of a learning curve, but anybody can do this, and you can reach a lot of people this way. So I'm hoping to show you, um, okay, good, it's going to come up here, at least part of how you can do a very quick co cooking demonstration. And um, let me try to click on this right now. And if it doesn't work, we'll skip it. Okay, oh there gosh. we go. And I'm gonna show you um, an easy way to massage it. This requires actually no equipment. You can do this literally with your hands and a surface. And it looks like I have five minutes left. So I actually am going to cut this off now. Um, but this is just showing you how, I'm showing how to prepare a massage kale salad. Um, and you can do this actually in your office setting, showing people how to strip and massage kale and the simple components if you prepared them on how to put this together. I encourage all of you who are thinking about teaching people how to cook here. to start with something as simple as that. Okay, I'm gonna stop this and um, go to my concluding slides. And so I'll have time for questions. Um, so in conclusion, I think I've shown in many ways that food and nutrition insecurity are prevalent everywhere. Um, and uh, that poor nutrition is correlated with chronic disease and early mortality. And that culinary medicine is a unique fun and accessible way to teach practical skills to sustainably improve nutrition in diverse communities and in so, so doing to improve health equity. I have a few resources here, which you can actually just Google. Um, there's a Kaiser Permanente San Francisco lifestyle medicine page and a healthy cooking page. So if you Google those search terms, you can find those. The healthy cooking page in particular, I'd like to point out uh, because it includes cooking videos, um, and a schedule for Thrive Kitchen cooking classes. Um, there's also a, a food for health blog that has recipes. Um, this is the name of my cookbook, Spicebox Kitchen. And um, one last thing, a quote, when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. And when diet is correct, medicine is of no need. Um, so think about that for a little bit. And again, the importance of diet and how powerful this is in a new way as a clinical intervention to reach people. And I will end with that. Thank you very much. Amazing talk, Dr. Shu. There are claps all around. Just um, I will do it on behalf of everyone else. There are literally a million questions. And so I'm going to, we're just going to jump in and see how many we can get to. Okay. Okay. All right, let's do it. That, that was amazing. You're doing just such beautiful work. We're really excited to hear about it. Um, so Kevin, and for anyone who wants to ask their question live, please come on video. Um, but I'm just going to start shooting some out. So Kevin um, asks, are insurance corporations starting to reimburse for food medicine? Are there differences between HMOs, non-HMOs? And related to that, I'm going to ask about industry partnership. I was just in uh, the Osher Utah Center uh, the Osher Center in Utah, and they are doing a food pharmacy and working with Kroger's uh, in part. And so just thinking about insurance, uh, obviously philanthropy, and then industry, can you comment on that? 
That is a huge question, um, and I'll try to answer it briefly. I think most of the attention right now is focusing on um, the medically tailored meals because that's kind of easy to have partnerships with industry, right? These are manufactured things. There's infrastructure for that. And medically tailored meals are pretty much covered as for people who need them for different amounts of time with certain medical conditions. So that is something that's already a covered benefit and has been for quite a while. Um, in terms of food pharmacy prescriptions, um, I think that is the next thing that is being looked at. And there are some partnerships. Um, Kroger is, is a big player in this, but there are many, many people who actually want to get into this. Um, and that includes actually we're doing this, we meaning Kaiser Permanente is doing a study that involves Instacart, which of course has a big infrastructure and platform for actually delivering the food to people. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Um, the question on on coverage, you know, the studies have to be there before I think people will cover it because it's it is still a little bit outside the box. Um, and then I think in terms of the um, cooking classes, I would love to see this as a covered benefit for everybody. Uh, the way that a lot of people who are doing this are around the country are doing it is through shared medical appointments or group medical visits, um, which are exactly what they sound like. They are actually medical visits in a group of people, and you can kind of throw your cooking demo or cooking class into that. Um, other than that, um, you know, it pretty much is philanthropy or subsidized classes um, or, or self-pay. So there are many ways to look at that, um, and I'm excited to see, you know, there's no one right way. It's whatever works works in your setting. Amazing. Um, next question that came in um, from Bridget, can you advise on strategies for parents to involve their families in meal prep? Oh, yes, I love that. So my kids are now college age, but, um, you know, I, I did have young children at one point. And the first thing is just to involve them in, from beginning to end bring them to the farmer's market with you. You know, I still remember trying to get my younger daughter to eat quinoa and she never liked it, never liked it. And then um, one day, you know, I always did sign them up for cooking, cooking classes at camp. She came home from her cooking class and she's like, I wanna make this quinoa salad tonight. I was like, really? And she's like, I made it today you know, I do it, right? I do it. And so involve them in, in doing it. So bring them to the farmer's market. You know, kids are cute. People will offer them things. They'll try out new things. And then after that, you can say, oh, what do you want to make from that? Um, there's a great cookbook called Chop Chop that is from a nonprofit in Boston that's for kids. And it has pictures of kids, right? So kids want to do things that other kids are doing. So you can take a look at that. Um, there are lots of things on the web, of course, but let them choose the food. Let them choose the recipe. It may not be exactly what you want, but it, it'll be fine. And you can always, I would also say never cook more than one menu, right? So I hate kids menus. <laughs> and I, as a mom and the cook in the house, I don't have time to cook two different things. So if what you're cooking for the kid is too bland for you, you can make two portions and then make it spicier for yourself or kind of convert it to make a sauce for your part of it to make it more to your palate. So basically just involve them. That is the short answer to that. It's so many gems in that. I love it. Um, Inez from Portugal uh, apparently is asking about nutrition education or teaching kitchens. Are you aware of any experiences involving migrants, refugees, or asylum seekers? Oh, that is a great question. Um, so teaching kitchens and refugees or asylum seekers. I feel like I I have heard about a program like this, but I I'm I'm sorry right now that I can't I can't think of it. Um I, I think there are some programs that that focus on this area, but I, I can't answer that right now. I'm sorry. Oh no, and, and we'll we'll see if we can find more on that too. Um, Catherine, one of our acupuncturist East Asian medicine experts is asking about food as medicine prescriptions. And do you, can you say more about particular conditions, for example, oncology or chronic pain, how you might approach it? Um, yeah. Okay. And so I, sorry, I think I cut out for just a second there, but sorry, I might've missed the beginning of that, but the question is about how to prescribe food for different conditions, how to so yeah, to, particularly around maybe oncology or chronic pain, how much you think about prescriptions for food as medicine. Okay. So um, if it's about medically tailored meals, these are already, that's already been, you know, kind of evaluated and designed um, by a dietitian who advises on those medically tailored meals. But if you're thinking about prescribing food, you know, to a patient, literally writing down 
um, a list of things in your office. I think for um, oncology is a little bit complex because it, it depends on, you know, if they're in active treatment and they um, have any, you know, issues with nausea, with mucositis, taste changes. That's a different story from someone who might be um, recovering or who might want to prevent cancer. But I, I'll just answer this quite simply that for most conditions, an anti-inflammatory diet is helpful um, and that a plant-rich diet is helpful. That That is by its definition, anti-inflammatory. You may think about, you know, avoiding added sugars um, in certain conditions, adding, um, avoiding gluten. Um, so it kind of depends, um, but each condition actually has kind of specific things that you may want to avoid or focus on. So I can't really answer that generically, except that having a plant predominant anti-inflammatory diet goes far in most conditions. Fabulous. Um, Esther C2 asks, what did you learn from your Michelin star cooking experiences? How does it enhance your uh, nutritional thinking? Um, and she has a particular question of what is your favorite, favorite spice and a recipe that might incorporate it? Oh my gosh. Wow. That's a big set of questions, Esther. So, um, it was a thrill to be able to spend time in the kitchen of a Michelin starred restaurant. But the, the things that I learned actually do apply. So one is that importance of making food look beautiful. You know, we say that we eat with our eyes first and the simplest food actually tastes better even if you plate it out. So I'll say to people, even, even if you're eating leftovers, even if you're eating just for one, or especially if you're eating just for one, put it on a plate, make it look nice. It will actually be much more satisfying from a health perspective that will slow you down because you'll want to enjoy your food more and, and that improves your satiety. So there are actually health benefits of that. I also learned um, how to flavor things and that applies to food too. So when I talked about using things other than salt, using spices and herbs, that did come from my restaurant experience um, also, but anybody can do this. Um, favorite spice? That's an unfair question. I have too many to answer. I will say that I, I, I'll i give you, I don't know, I'll give you one. One is cardamom, and I like to use it in both sweet and savory preparations. I like to sprinkle it on my coffee every morning. So that's one very simple recipe. Um, I also um, use cardamom in some savory ways and certain curries and stews. Um, but you'll have to check out my book, which I'll say is available at the library as well. So you can promote that to your patients and they don't even have to buy it. It's available in the public library. I think I answered all your questions with that though. <laughs> you're, you're on an amazing run. This is fabulous. Um, I'm going to keep going while we have a few minutes. And actually I just put, um, uh, Ariana actually uh, gave us some information about refugee uh, work that's being done. And so I put that into the chat for folks who are curious about that. Kavita, can I ask a question? This is oh, Donald. Yeah. I can't, I yeah, can't come on video for some reason, but uh, Lisa, Hi, Donald. Thank, you that, thank you for that fabulous presentation. It was really beautiful. I, I just finished reading a book I think my patient recommended called Outlive by Peter Atia, who used Atia. to be, uh -huh. he used to be a, a cancer uh a uh, surgeon, and then he became disenfranchised uh, with that, and now he's a concierge physician, and he wrote this book called Outlive about longevity, and he had two chapters on nutrition that really bothered me. The second one talks about the four basic macronutrients, alcohol, protein, carbohydrates, and fat, which I found pretty offensive, but he, what my question is, he really, he used to be a boxer, and he's very big on physical activity, and he he suggested that we eat enormous amounts of protein as we age to build muscle. And I know many of the oncology uh, uh, dietitians at UCSF really tell all my cancer patients to bump up their protein to levels that I think are too much. And Peter says that it's animal protein that benefits us and not plant. And so again, I found that all very disturbing. And I wonder if you read the book or what you think about that protein uh, recommendation. Yes, so I haven't read the book, but I've read about it. Um, and that's a very interesting second chapter that you mentioned there. On the protein um, part of it, so most, for the most part, most Americans have adequate protein or even excess protein, um, but that does not apply to as people to as people are getting older or people people in high metabolic states as with people who have cancer. So yes, the idea of needing more protein at certain stages or in certain conditions in life um, is true, but I disagree that it needs to be animal protein. 
um, it can include animal protein, but everything that I said in my talk, I still stand by that plant-based proteins are completely adequate. Um, and if, um, you know, I, I would say that increasing the amount of protein, you know, I don't know what the levels are that he talked about. Um, I, I would disagree that it has to be animal protein. Thanks. You're welcome. Amazing. Um, Maria Chow, who um, can't get on camera, but is asking a question as well. Um, she appreciates how much you've covered individual behaviors and cultural resonance. And I, I have to say, I love that as well. She wants, wonders about, could you speak to structural factors, for example, folks who have food insecurity um, and they're short on time or money, uh, they may go for fast food because it's cheap and has, um, uh, you know, can fulfill their needs to what they seem to need. Um, could you speak to those structural factors? Yeah, I mean, those are huge. And there's, I, I actually often will say, you know, I, I can't compete with a dollar menu, right? So getting something that costs a dollar through the drive through I can't say I can do anything faster than that. However, I do have suggestions. So one, in terms of access, again, and I, I am on the board of the food bank. I, I, I really love the work that we do at the food bank. We really think about all of these things. And again, 60% of what we distribute is fresh produce. And we also provide protein often the form of something like a frozen chicken, right? So these are things that um, will address the food insecurity issue, the access to it. Um, I talked about frozen vegetables, and I think that's something to keep in mind. Those are really inexpensive. They're also convenient. You can keep them in your freezer all the time. Um, and they often actually have higher nutrient density than fresh produce that's been sitting there for a while. So giving people the license to use that. And then finally, in terms of time, I think um, it will take time. You know, I fully see that somebody who is working two or three jobs literally has no time to cook. But if they have even part of a day off per week or have somebody in their family who does to meal prep, cooking one day a week, freezing it, refrigerating it and repurposing it. These are really good skills to have for anybody, whether or not you have food insecurity, right? So I, I often say like for myself, I might cook three days a week, but then I, I keep leftovers and I repurpose those. So they look like new things and they're still interesting. These are skills that can actually go along way and I would say can be just as fast as getting takeout or going through the drive-through if you've prepared in advance so it takes kind of changing your behavior around that amazing and we have one minute left I'm going to try to get one more question in uh, which is around medical schools and what kind of education and culinary medicine are you seeing more and more med schools providing how can we do more in that aspect yeah. So um, the great news is that there's now legislation that is going to require all residency programs to provide a certain amount of education around this. And also in medical school, I'm sorry, it, it was in medical schools. We may see this uh, filter into graduate medical education as well. Um, and so there are some cul culinary medicine electives. I'm actually about to launch one at the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine in, um, in early winter. Um, but there are, I don't know, actually, I should know the number off the top of my head. A dozen, maybe a couple, maybe a couple dozen of medical schools around the country that are offering some sort of nutrition education that focuses on culinary, culinary medicine more than just a nutrition lecture. So it's growing. Um, and if you are medical school faculty, you know, there are people who are interested in this. I was told yesterday by a medical student at UCSF who reached out to me that um, Dr. Thiara of the food pharmacy had a um, meeting for medical students interested in culinary medicine and 30 people showed up at UCSF. So I think the future is bright because I think this appeals to people who want to do something a little bit different, um, who you know can see the power of this um, that goes beyond what is traditionally taught in the rest of our curriculum. Amazing, Dr. Shu, um, right on time. Thank you so much for that power session. Uh, there are so many questions more. Please, Dr. Shu has shared her uh, information. Please feel free to contact her um, and her books uh, and all of her different uh, resources. Big claps all around. Thank you so much, Dr. Shu. This was amazing, really wonderful work and wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for having me.